really a, a privilege to be here, a pleasure to be here. And I want to say this process really started a little while ago. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, in the back? We still have, there's some major donor seats right up front. <laughs> Louder. There are some major donor seats right up front, if you, no donation required. Um, but uh, it was a while back that we met, um, and I have to say a lot of the schools that we've worked with over the years, the dedication of the staff here and commitment to putting this together, and your board as well. Um, it's not often that we have the opportunity to speak to a board before coming into a school and really their commitment. Uh, so thank you, thank you for having me. Um, my name, as uh, I was introduced before, is Dr. Ellie Shapiro. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, I have a doctorate in education. It's a bit confusing, and my mother, since I started doing digital citizenship, actually thinks I'm a computer programmer. So, with that said, if, if it's okay, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna go off script for a second. Excuse me, okay, I'm just gonna. Perfect, thank you. Thank you for participating in that. Um, just uh, by a raise of hands, those of you that here that are here think you're here for an internet safety speech. Just raise your hands. Okay, can you put them down? Thank you. Um, I'd like you to change your paradigm for a minute because I think we've all heard so much about internet safety at different points, and we've heard about filters, and filters are so important, and internet safety is so important, but technology, which is what we're really dealing with today, is a much bigger issue. It's much bigger than just filters, it's much bigger than just the internet. And what we're real, really dealing with today, I'm gonna have to turn around once in a while just to see the screen, okay. What we're really dealing with today is about technology. Technology is really that all-encompassing uh, issue, everyone's got their cell phones, did you turn them off? Okay. How many of you here, by the way, just a quick raise of hands, have experienced phantom vibrations? That's when your body starts buzzing, even though, okay, according to the statistics, it's about 80% of you, so, okay. So phantom vibration. So technology is all encompassing. It impacts us in so many ways to the point where our bodies are conditioned to buzz in the anticipation of a phone call, a text, etc. So today we're really dealing with technology. So if the paradigm is um, is internet safety, I'd like you to think more in terms of digital citizenship. And the big question comes out, as my mother has asked, what exactly is digital citizenship? I've gotten all sorts of answers about becoming a citizen, new Obama plan to create citizens, illegal immigrants through a digital process. I've heard that. But in, uh, in actuality, what digital citizenship is uh, are the norms of appropriate and responsible behavior when it comes to technology. And when it comes to the society that we're living in, those norms have not been clearly defined. For example, for a public speaker to turn around and take a selfie uh, in the middle of a public speech, I don't know if that fits the norms of appropriate and responsible behavior. I recently was at a wedding, and as the brother of the Kala was walking down, he stopped in the middle of the aisle, pulled out a selfie stick, and, and took the picture. He certainly captured a great moment, but it did raise some eyebrows as uh, the standards of this behavior were questionable to some and others thought it was great. So when we think about digital citizenship, we want to really define what are the norms of appropriate and responsible behavior. And that I think we do as a community, every community is different. Am I blocking? Can you see the screen? Okay. Um, today we're inundated with technology. It just doesn't end. We have phones, we have the Google glasses. I don't think it took off, but I actually read an article about uh, about Google contact lenses. Have you heard about that? I think it's gonna be primarily used for the medical field, but uh, nonetheless, um, our enmeshment with technology and our engagement with technology has become so connected that we don't even know where we begin and the technology uh, where we end and the technology begins. We've really come a long way in a very uh, short period of time. How many people remember 1984? Not the book, not the movie, all right, okay. Uh, how many people remember 1964? All right, okay. Um, so really in a very short period of time, we've come a long way. Um, so where we're moving with technology and where things are going, um, we really need to be a little more deliberative. So what we're gonna talk today about um, this evening about are some of the benefits of technology, some of the great things about technology. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the challenges of technology, uh, how it impacts us socially, psychologically, behaviorally, and in our day-to-day -day functioning. Uh, we're going to talk about strategies that you as parents can engage in to help maximize technology and minimize some of the risks associated with technology. Um, and we're going to talk about some specific data 
<coughs> excuse me, as it relates to this community. Um, <coughs> So let's talk about uh, what technology has to offer. I ask this to every group. No one's gotten it yet, so um, everyone knows Charles Dickens' famous words, uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Raise of hands, everybody knows that? Great, perfect. What's the next line? <coughs> the beginning of the end. Ooh, what, what? Oh, close. The next line, it was, uh, we got someone? No, you can right, okay. <coughs> Good point. Uh, it was the age of uh, the, the ghost time, the worst time. The age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. That's the following line. And I really think when we think about the times that we're living in, it is the best of times. It is the worst of times. Um, and it is the age of wisdom. And it is the age of foolishness. Technology offers us so much. It offers us uh, opportunity in the ways of accessibility. It offers us productivity. I think. No one would argue that in today's day and age, we're so much more productive as a result of technology. Um, and that's a really an opportunity. Some, somehow we still don't have enough time in the day, but we are more productive. Uh, information is accessible. We could have just looked up the next line in Dickens right now and, and had that available to us. And um, connectivity, when we think about connectivity, uh, it's just remarkable. It wasn't so long ago that we had long distance phone calls. Does anyone? Remember long distance? Well, just another raise of hands. I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep it interactive. It's hard with a large group. But how many people here are from Passaic? How many people are here from Clifton? I see some people raise their hand twice. <laughs> What's that about? Okay, I live in Farakaway, so I get Farakaway Lawrence, you know. Okay. But back in the day, and not even so long ago, about 10, 15 years ago, if you wanted to call Farakaway from Lawrence or vice versa, it was called a regional phone call. I would imagine it was probably similar from uh, Clifton to Passaic. Um, but it was a regional phone call, literally around the corner. And today's day and age, we can literally be videoing with family and friends across the world uh, for relatively free. So we're living in an amazing times. So it really is the best of times in so many ways. But it's also the worst of times, because technology brings challenges that we never had to deal with in the past. I, I often like to say that we don't have a Masora uh, for raising kids in technology. We didn't grow up in this high-tech age, and we didn't see how our parents raised us. So this is really new for everybody. Our kids are the first generation growing up in this high-technology age, and we're the first generation of parents parenting these kids, and we're the first generation of educators educating these kids. So it's a whole new world. So no one should feel bad if you haven't figured it out by now, because it's a process. Um, and some of the areas that technology impacts is the social domain, the behavioral domain, the psychological domain, and the day-to-day, -day, uh, and there's day-to-day -day impact on technology as well. So what we're gonna do is really focus on some of that impact um, and hopefully by being able to identify it and having a common language between us, between the school and your children, we're gonna be better equipped to manage their technology use. How are kids spending their time today? Kids today are spending a lot of time with their technology and their devices. The best study that I saw is an old study already, it's from 2009, um, and it's the Kaiser Family Foundation, and they found that kids today are spending, today, 2009, um, seven and a half hours a day on their devices of screen time in front of a screen. And when you think about the combined hours, in other words, sitting in front of a television with a device, or sitting in front of the computer with a device, or sitting in front of a device with their device, <laughs> we're talking about 11 hours a day. And we think about that's a tremendous amount of time, 11 hours in the day. And the impact is only greater when you're spending that much time in front of the devices. The American Medical uh, the Pediatric Society recommends uh, no more than two hours a day of screen time. So consider that most kids have already gone past that in the first uh, two hours of the day. Um, you know, they wake up and they check the sports scores and you know, they, they have their screen time. Um, so it's important to keep in mind uh, screen time is a big issue. I'm just gonna let this scroll. Uh, this is, can everybody see that? No, all right, so teens and technology by the numbers. These are just a lot of statistics letting you know that teens are engaged in technology. A lot of people spend a lot of time researching this stuff, and apparently they have found that kids are engaged with technology. But the numbers are pretty staggering. 90% of this, 95% of that. Um, online engagement, social media, social networking. Now these are the statistics from society as a whole. Um, generally when I go to a lecture and I hear statistics 
from society as a whole, I kind of disregard it because I say, well, not my, not my school, not my kids, not my population. So we, we're going to be able to look and compare a little bit how we're doing as a community uh, versus the society as a whole. Um, for example, 74% uh, of teens use their mobile devices to browse the web. The numbers are significantly less in our community. We also face the challenge of a generational disconnect. Um, as, as we said, we grew up in a different time. This generational disconnect, um, the terms that we're hearing used in comparison to our, great, our grandparents in the 1920s and 30s, we are digital immigrants. And if you're over 30 or so, you are a digital immigrant. Our kids are digital natives. And we have that disconnect between us and our kids in understanding technology. I'll even give you an example. Uh, last Hanukkah, we got for my kids um, the, uh, Kindles, Amazon Kindles. Um, kind of safe, you know, it's not an iPad, Kindles. Um, and the technology, I, I didn't even want to learn it. I, like, it took me so long just to switch from, from PC to Mac. And I finally got that straight. And now we got a Kindle, which is like a whole different movement and, and uh, my wife decided she'll take care of that, which was great. So that's why I think there are two people. Uh, it works out really well uh, because I can't, and I'm, you know, relatively on the younger spectrum of parents raising kids in this digital world. Um, I'm on the younger spectrum, and it's my job to know this stuff. So when you put those two things together, if I'm disinterested and I feel like I'm kind of worn out from these technology advancements, imagine how other people feel. Um, so we have a generational disconnect. I'm going to read it because it's probably hard to see. Um, your great aunt just passed away, LOL. Um, this is a mother sending her son David a text. David replies, why is that funny? Uh, it's not funny, David, what do you mean? <laughs> Mom, LOL means laughing out loud. Oh my goodness, I sent that to everyone. I thought it meant <laughs> lots of love. Yeah, we're laughing, but we've been there. <laughs> we, we've missed out on some of the lingo, you know. My daughter comes home, she says things at school were totes cray. I, some of you know what that means. Totes cray? Totally crazy. Totes cray. Come on. Get with it. All right. So we have a generational disconnect, clearly. Um, <laughs> And what we see in the literature is 91% of, of parents, when polled, are saying that they're, or 90%, 91% say that they're well informed about what their kids are doing online. But in reality, the kids are reporting uh, that only 60%, only 60% of the teens say their parents know what they're doing online. And that number is high because this study was conducted by the Pew study, and their methodology was flawed because, think about this, this is how they did the study. Uh, they called the kids on the phone, but they required the parents to be on the phone with the kids as they were asking the question. <laughs> so apparently 30% of the kids, <laughs> yeah, were straight and said, yeah, my parents don't know a thing, while their parents were on the phone. But 60%, 60% uh, uh, say that. Okay. 47% of kids have uh, looked up a website that their parents would disapprove of. Again, this is not us. We want to stay calm. 47% of kids uh, have looked up a website that their parents would disapprove of. And there is this disconnect between our generation and our kids. So I really, I commend you on being here, uh, primarily because, um, I mean, you had to, but past that, <laughs> it's really great that you're here, um, because taking the time to really connect and understand this generational difference is really critical. All right, so, I can skip. Oh, yeah, so Facebook has 1.2, it was actually 1.5 billion users now. Uh, this was last year's statistics. So 1.2 billion users, and the average age is about 40, 42. So we as parents, we say, okay, we're going to be on top of our kids' social media. We're going to get on Facebook. We're going to get on the Facebook, and we're going to be on top of the things. And we're going to see what our kids are doing. But the kids really aren't on Facebook. E even statistically here, it's like almost, almost non-existent um, because the kids are elsewhere. There are so many different social media uh, avenues to connect with one another. And again, let's not forget, social media really offers tremendous opportunity. It, th there is accessibility, there's information, the connectivity. What happens when your kid came home and forgot homework? Has that ever happened here? Just me. All right, just me. 
but you can text WhatsApp, someone in the class, get the information, get a picture of the homework, print it out. Amazing technology. However, the downside, and we're going to talk more about the downside, but kids today, Snapchat is like the biggest used app today uh, amongst the kids. Um, it's actually the second most used app uh, in the percentage of kids that utilize social media. But Snapchat was really created with uh, the owner of Snapchat right now. He's 25 years old. He's worth about $3 billion. Uh, he was on the Forbes 400 list. Uh, and he created the app to encourage, he was in college, encourage uh, members of the opposite gender to send pictures of various uh, clothed or unclothed pictures to uh, the guys. And the idea is that Snapchat, it disappears in 10 seconds. Whatever the image, or the image, the message, it disappears in 10 seconds. So the idea is to be disinhibited. Feel comfortable to send what you want. And to me, I, I you know, there are issues with apps. This is a really challenging app for me. I have a personal bias towards it. I just, I don't understand. Um, they've actually taken the high road in recent interviews. They say, we provide people with the opportunity to express themselves in a guilt-free environment to be able to, uh, you know, share without the fear of it having come back to haunt them. And that's really nice of them. Uh, but Snapchat is an issue. Um, and we'll talk more about uh, that. But, you know, we have a whole social media revolution going on. Issues that kids are facing today, they have unwanted contact, cyberbullying, objectionable material, sharing information with strangers, technology dependence, impact on real world in interactions, impulsivity, and disinhibition. These are just, these are the challenges that kids face today. And it's really a monumental amount of challenges to deal with and things that we did not really have to deal with uh, to that degree. Um, so we have to understand that. So when we, we think about the impact of domains, once again, we're going to go into each one in more depth. We have behavioral, we have social, we have psychological, and we have day-to-day. -day. Okay. Behavioral. So when we think about behavioral, we, uh, we uh, are dealing with excuse me, dependence, distraction, impulsivity, and disinhibition. I think that any teacher could tell you that kids are a little more distracted today. It's a little more difficult to keep them interested. Um, I recently watched the movie The Swiss Family Robinson from 1960-something, 63, 64, and I was amazed at how long each scene was. It just took forever <laughs> and ever, and the dialogue was just ongoing, and it was, it was, today, things move at such a quick pace, and uh, remember we talked about that uh, phantom vibration uh, situation? Uh, so we have been conditioned to th see things change instantly. We're used to that. We talked about ADD, ADHD being more prevalent. What we do have more prevalent is our attention span has been conditioned to not focus for more than a few seconds. Um, and that makes learning and education a much harder prospect as well. So we have distraction. We have technology dependence. We have impulsivity, and we have disinhibition. We're going to go through a few of these. Two in five teens admit to having posted something online that they later regretted. Really, that goes back to the impulsivity. There's something about technology. I think if we all think about um, times where we got an email or a text, and we have an initial reaction to respond, and we just quickly respond, right? That's impulsivity. We see a, a Dan's Deal sale. Anyone Dan's Deal's followers here? <laughs> right? Dan's Deal sale, and we impulsively buy 50 hot cups that we didn't need, <laughs> right? Okay. Now we're getting it. Um, so there's a certain something about technology that promotes impulsivity. Um, and teens, preteens, by their very nature, are pretty impulsive as it is. That's their biological makeup. They're just made that way. Um, and so to pair them with technology, you're taking an impulsive by nature kid and giving them technology, we have more impulsivity. 85% of teens uh, sleep with their cell phones within reach. Why is that a problem? So they sleep within reach. So there's two issues that, uh, that, that come from that. One is um, artificial light from the devices uh, trick the brain into thinking that it's daytime. There are actually two recent studies. Uh, Purdue University in 2012 looked at the impact of devices on your sleep patterns, and what they found was 
that it made it more difficult to fall asleep and staying asleep. Adults, you can listen into this too. It affects us as well. Um, it made it more difficult to fall asleep and stay asleep, we, uh, not as good quality of a sleep. Harvard University last year did a study and compared reading an e-book, reading uh, an e-reader, versus reading a book before going to bed, and they found similar results that reading the book put you to sleep um, and the uh, e-reader actually made it more difficult to sleep. So these are some of the challenges. So even if the device is being taken out of the room at night, which is something that we recommend, just the act of within an hour or two of going to sleep, being on a computer and being on a device will impact your sleep quality. So it's important to keep that in mind. The second thing is, the same way, when we keep going back to this uh, conditioning, the same way that we've been conditioned to anticipate the vibrations, uh, we anticipate the phone calls, we anticipate the texts. So when we're sleeping, we're sort of in this elevated level of sleep where we're not quite sleeping, and we're sort of anticipating the buzz. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind, how that impacts our quality of sleep, and for our kids, what that does to them when they're sleeping. Uh, they're coming in a little more uh, groggy in the morning, and they're not quite getting uh, the sleep that they need. Um, disinhibition, we'll talk about that for a minute. There's something about the online realm that promotes disinhibition. Disinhibition is a term coined by psychologist John Suller, uh, which is basically that in the online realm, we are going to do things, uh, and through the technology realm, we're going to do things that we would not normally do uh, or say in real life. And I think we can all connect to that to a degree where we feel this sense of anonymity to uh, post a negative review for a restaurant uh, that we went to. Um, more likely to do that than we would actually go to the person face to face and say something. Uh, we might respond uh, to something that we're upset about in a more harsh way through the digital medium because we are less inhibited. There's that sense of anonymity. And the anonymity is, only, is not only when there's pure anonymity. Of course, one would think that if they don't know my name, they don't know who I am, I'm going to do and say things that I wouldn't normally do and say. But even uh, if you know who it is. So for example, if I were to send you an email, it would come from my email account, which is ellie at ellieshapiro.com. Okay? We know who it is. I know you know who I am. I'm still more likely to do or say something in that realm because we don't have that face-to-face -face connection. Everything online is public and permanent. So if you put it out there, it's there. Um, you know, we usually say, uh, what would Bubby Shirley think? And everyone should uh, you know, fill in the blank for your Bubby. But think that every, um, every thing you put online, every email, every text, every tweet, every post, think that Bubby Shirley is going to see it. And would you want her to see that? So. <coughs> The, co the correlation between anonymity and behavior is not a new concept. Uh, the, the research um, by Zimbardo and Stanley Milgram, everyone knows those famous electric shock studies, um, when the people were made to be anonymous, they delivered longer and stronger shocks than when they were not made to be anonymous. So the relationship between anonymity and behavior is a long-standing one, but technology has certainly made it more challenging. Social. Social is something that I like to talk about a lot, um, primarily because I think if there was one area um, in technology that everyone is really impacted, you know, in some areas when it comes to uh, graphic imagery online or um, aggressive behavior online, it applies to this group, it applies to that group. Social applies to everybody. Everybody is impacted by the social challenges. So we have digital distraction. Digital distraction. I mean, uh, the truth is I was watching you in the lobby here. It seems to be a pretty friendly bunch of people. Um, everybody was smiling, seemed happy to be here. Um, people weren't checking their devices. They were actually like, looking and communicating. Uh, so that's really nice to see. Um, a lot of times you go into uh, communities or you go to simchas, you go to weddings, bar mitzvahs, and you see that people are just distracted by their devices. And it's not only that they're distracted by their devices, they've been conditioned to be distracted. They've been conditioned for the scene to change every 30 seconds. So if your conversation is going more than 30 seconds, they're looking for the next, the next thing. You ever get that feeling that you're speaking to someone and they're sort of looking over what the next? The, the term that the kids use, we'll see how with it this crowd is, is FOMO. Who's heard of FOMO? Someone yell it out. Come on. All right. Very good. All right. We got a savvy group here. 
fear of missing out. We have a fear of missing out. So it creates digital distraction. We want to know what the next big thing is. Social dependence. Um, there was a study out of Yeshiva University a little while ago um, that uh, you've heard the term half Shabbos. Um, about 12% of otherwise Shomer Shabbos uh, teens um, in the modern Orthodox community uh, report utilizing social media um, on Shabbos. And there's a lot of other research uh, about texting addiction, not specific to the uh, Orthodox uh, or Jewish community, but texting addiction, where people engage in texting in unhealthy ways. That's social dependence. And we see the connection between social anxiety and the need to connect with the devices. So we have issues around social dependence, online aggression, cyberbullying, miscommunication. Miscommunication is a great, uh, a great area because there are so many ways of saying the same thing. Um, think in your mind, I'm just going to say a word, and how many different ways it can be interpreted, okay? And just think about reading it, okay? The word is whatever. Whatever. It could be you know, whatever. It could be whatever. <sighs> whatever. Right? Or okay is another, another one of those. Okay. 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 Right? So oftentimes, have you ever uh, received an email that you misinterpreted what the intention of the person was when they were sending the email? No? Yes? Okay. One guy back there. I see him. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for humoring me. <coughs> Did you ever send an email that was misinterpreted uh, what your intention was? More people. Okay, two people. All right. So there's something about the digital realm that promotes miscommunication, that um, we have to be so careful in how we communicate in the digital realm. We talk about um, the social challenges and the FOMO. We talk about eye contact, basic social skills. I hear from teachers all the time um, that kids are just not connecting. There's a certain amount of time that is the right amount of time to make eye contact with someone uh, when establishing a meaningful relationship. That's usually about 60 to 70 percent of a conversation. Uh, ki adults today are only making eye contact about 30 to 60 percent of the time. So quantitatively, we have more relationships. We have 5,000 Facebook friends. Fantastic. <laughs> but uh, qualitatively, the relationships are not quite there. And again, we grew up in a different time. We grew up, we learned um, how to make eye contact. We learned about developing social relationships without technology. We've added technology on. Our kids are growing up in a time where technology it goes together with developing relationships. So this is some of the, these are some of the challenges that we have when it comes to social development. Online cruelty. We've heard so many stories in the news. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but with really tragic results. Online cruelty, cyberbullying, 88% uh, of teens have witnessed other people being mean or cruel online. Uh, in the data, about 12% or so of kids have been cyber bullied, cyber victim themselves. And my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation, was specifically on cyber bullying in Jewish day schools. And we found about the same rate in yeshivas of uh, cyber victimization as uh, there is in the general population. Uh, about uh, 12%, 11, 12%. Great question. I'm going to hold questions till the end, but I'm going to answer that, and I apologize. If I use a term that you, you can ask a question about a term. Fair enough? Okay. Um, bullying is the abuse of power with the intent to harm others. So that's when someone deliberately is going out of their way to make someone feel bad, to exclude them. Uh, Cyberbullying is basically uh, doing that, but in the digital realm. Um, so cyberbullying is, it could be something like posting a picture of someone and uh, saying, doesn't this person look stupid, you know, share with your friends. Um, it could be um, creating a group, a chat group, a WhatsApp group, and excluding someone, intentionally leaving someone out. Uh, we see that sort of type of bullying more with girls. We see the more aggressive uh, type of bullying with boys. Um, and this relational aggression um, through the digital realm. Now, the challenge is uh, bullying is something that's terrible all the time, but when it occurs uh, on the playground or in the community, it's an event, it happens, um, and then it, it ends. And you may have another event that happens and it ends, uh, but it ends. 
When it comes to cyberbullying, a specific act can have no end. I'm not talking about the feelings that people experience. When people are bullied, the feelings can be ongoing. But the act in and of itself ends. In cyberbullying, the act can keep on going. And really, we've had some really tragic and profound outcomes. And we get the same degree of uh, bullying reported um, in the Yeshiva Day School system as we do in the general population. So really, this is not, uh, this is something that is I inherent in uh, the behavioral makeup of kids today without education. Psychological. Uh, there can be negative psychological impacts of, of, uh, as a result of technology uh, when it comes to overdependence. We see correlations uh, with anxiety, depression, isolation, and addiction. Um, very high correlation relationship between, um, between anxiety and technology. So avid cell phone use, uh, teens generally report their cell phones enhance their lifestyle. Um, we see at younger and younger ages, kids are getting devices. They're asking for cell phones. I don't know, my wife got her cell phone, she was, I think, 25 when she got her cell phone. And my, you know, my daughter, you know, she, uh, my oldest daughter was pushing at uh, 13 for one, and now my 11-year-old um, is pushing for one as well. So this is the challenge, and I think a lot has to do with the communal culture. And I think something we're going to mention at the end um, is an opportunity to uh, really cohesively set policies for your classes as a whole, but we'll get to that. Uh, so teens say that cell phones, avid cell phone use enhances their lifestyle. What the research seems to suggest is that cell phone use uh, increases anxiety and we see lower grades and lower levels of subjective well-being. Subjective well-being, just a fancy word for you know, happiness. Um, so we see the increased anxiety. I think we can all relate to a degree about dependence on, on the cell phone. Some of us more, some of us less. Anybody ever leave their house um, or go into a meeting and realize they left their phone in the car? Or, yeah, one person, thank you <laughs> for humoring me, okay. There's that initial sense of panic, you know, I do this. Um, and then, right, that panic. So depending on what your degree of anxiety in relationship to your cell phone is, uh, you're either gonna go back and get it or you'll say, all right, I'll get it later. That really depends on your relationship with your device. Um, people with higher levels of anxiety to begin with are more dependent on their devices as well. The devices themselves cause increased anxiety. So that's something to keep in mind with our kids. What is their relationship with their devices? That's something we have to assess uh, each one of our kids. Their relationship becomes critical um, with their devices. <clears throat> The internet, we haven't really talked much about the internet, we've been talking about devices, but the internet offers a lot of uh, opportunity to learn about issues, but it also normalizes negative behavior. So um, if, a, a, if someone wants to look up um, about substance abuse or, or eating disorders or cutting or other issues that kids face today, so they can look up, but it kind of normalizes. And they find there's a group that you know, supports them. And like, oh, there's a lot of kids out there uh, like me who do that. So that, reinfor that can be reassuring, but it also reinforces negative behavior. And we see people engaging in more and more questionable behavior, and it certainly filters down to our kids as well. Early exposure to inappropriate websites and graphic violence can result in distress. Very high numbers of kids being distressed by what they see online. And this is one area that is universal across the board, no matter what community. It's really a, around 50% of kids report that they have seen something uh, online that disturbed them. And we'll get a little more into that towards the end. Um, and the, the impact of that can really be long term. Nearly 80% of unwanted exposure to pornography takes place at home. Um, and 40% of the links uh, occurred as a result of an innocent word search. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, we were looking for perm costumes uh, with my family around the computer, um, and we decided we we're gonna dress up as uh, farmers that year. So my wife innocently typed in um, for costumes, farm girls. <laughs> innocent enough, but what came out of the search was not innocent enough. So these are some of the challenges that we're facing as well. Um, before we go on to day to day, I wanna talk about one other thing in the psychological realm. <coughs> and this really applies to adults and kids alike. Um, 
we mentioned about lower levels of subjective well-being, but trying to understand why that is, what's the relationship between the two. Uh, there was a study by Peterson and Seligman, these are the two founders of positive psychology, and it was called the Positive Journaling Study. If you've ever heard uh, David Pelkovitz speak, uh, he, he often cites this study, where people who write down five positive things that occurred to them during the day, um, really over a period of time, their overall levels of subjective well-being were significantly higher compared to a group that did nothing, okay? So writing down positive things, focusing on positive things is a, a great thing to do. I encourage, we do it in my house, uh, we go around the table Friday night and each person uh, says one thing that happened during the past week that they're grateful for. And uh, really promotes a great conversation, but also helps them look back on the past week and find something positive that they wanna focus on. And this really improves subjective well-being in individuals. So the flip side is true as well. If you write down negative things, your overall subjective well-being uh, diminishes. And so when it comes to technology, we talked before about the disinhibition and the impulsivity, we're more likely to post, tweet, comment negative things than we are to do positive things. If you just look at Yelp for reviews, they're mostly negative. Uh, the people that are gonna take the time or to quickly do something, it's generally gonna be negative. In fact, there was a study um, on Twitter hashtags. Everybody know what a hashtag is? Great. Hashtags are the number signs, right? The pound signs for us uh, old folks. They're pound signs. Hashtags um, are basically, it's the pound symbol and you put a word next to it. Now what that does is, it, um, it basically it's a, it's a fancy filing system. So if I wanna find out, everybody know what YOLO is? You only live once. You only live once, all right, good. I like this group. All right, so YOLO. <coughs> so you, if you wanna find out what everybody's up to that feels that they only live once, you would go into Twitter and you would type in YOLO and anyone who did hashtag YOLO, you get to see what they're YOLOing about, okay? So that's, that's the filing system. Best day ever, or if you wanna find out what the best sandwich ever has occurred, every person that tweeted a picture of their sandwich and wrote hashtag best sandwich ever, you can then see where all the best sandwiches ever um, are located. So that's really convenient if you want a sandwich. Um, <coughs> that's what it has. But what they found was they did a study and they looked at positive uh, hashtags to negative hashtags. And what they found was that for every positive hashtag, there were two negative hashtags. Meaning, not I love best day ever, I hate worst day ever, was twice as common as, as the, uh, as the uh, former. So what we're actually doing is we are partaking in our own victimization of negativity because we are out there posting negative things and it's having an impact on our psychological functioning. Okay, so that I wanted to just put that out there as well. Keep that in mind, how technology impacts us. The flip side is we can utilize technology for positive. We can post and really actively engage in posting positive things and that will have a positive impact on our functioning as well. So that's something that when we work with kids that are already engaged in social media, we don't encourage them to engage in social media, but those that are out there, how do you want to approach uh, your emotional uh, well-being? In the day-to-day -day challenges, we also have something called clickbait. You said, sir, you work for AT&T, you still do? Long time ago. Long time ago. Anyone in the um, technology world loves clickbait. It's basically psychologically designed to make you wanna click uh, the image. So right now, you're not gonna believe what happens when this girl drank a Coke. You, I, I can see in your eyes, you wanna click it. <laughs> <coughs> you want me to, right? You wanna know what happened. We get that all the time. We get that across our screens and, oh my gosh, I must know what my dentist isn't telling me. <laughs> I, I must know. So, <coughs> <coughs> when, as adults, hopefully we uh, are able to withhold from just randomly moving on, but kids today, um, and, and they're designed for kids to, to challenge them to, to move forward. And oftentimes, these links don't lead to what they indicate, because I still have not found out what happened to this girl when she drank a cup, <laughs> and I've been looking. Um, so when we think about um, this day-to-day -day challenge that kids have, um, with technology. <coughs> we also talk about this idea um, of public and permanent. Any of the computer people uh, here know that everything online is public and permanent. 
Uh, it's just a question of how you can access that information. And as time goes on, uh, things, it's getting easier and easier to access this information. This is actually my website. Um, when they designed my website, I had asked them to put a counter on so I know how many, uh, how many friends I have and who's coming to visit me. Um, and what I found out was that not only does it tell me how many people go to the website, but it gives me their IP address uh, and their location uh, where they were logging in. And what that means is that any time every one of your devices, your phones, your iPads, your computers, they all have IP addresses, which is a, a IP address is a unique signature for each device um, and really is your uh, trail, which is why when you hear about things like anonymous social networking, uh, things like Yik Yak, Secret, Whisper, these are um, social networking that encourage you to post what you want because it's anonymous, Snapchat as well to a degree. Um, and the idea is that you can say what you want, do what you want, and there's no consequences. But every time you hear of some school district somewhere where a kid does a bomb threat through Yik Yak because they didn't want to take the math test that day, they get arrested within the hour. And the reason that is is because every device has an IP address that is traceable. So kids today are doing things they don't necessarily realize that if it's a criminal act or if something happens that requires an investigation, they're going to be investigated, and there is nothing that's really private. You can do a reverse IP address lookup and really uh, narrow it down exactly where, um, where things are happening. So one of the things that I advise schools when I work with schools, more important than the actual academic grades that kids are getting um, and their academic abilities is their digital footprint. In five years, getting a job, your digital footprint will have more of an impact on the jobs you get than the actual grades that you receive. And if you want to take it a step further, shaduchim, it's a whole new ball game out there. You know, the idea of when you get read someone, you don't make a phone call or two, you do a Google search and you find out. And there are companies that are doing background research. And as technology advances, it's becoming easier and easier to uh, find out about people. And once it's out there, there's no way to get rid of it. So we want to educate our kids today about the public and permanent nature. So imagine if you were out there and you were you know, saying all these negative things here and all these negative things there, and you posted a picture here, a picture there. Those can come back to haunt you years later down the road. Um, so it's something that we need to tell our kids. Imagine, though, if our kids were focused on putting positive things out there about a chesed program or a tzedakah program that they were engaged in. And then when you look them up online, you see all the positive things that they were doing. So for better or worse, this is th the direction that society is going in, and your digital footprint is critical. So we need to help our kids um, be better, uh, be better digital citizens. This is really a new realm of, of uh, education within schools. It's something that five years ago, no one even heard of digital citizenship. Um, we heard about internet safety, we heard about filters, and yes, those are important, but uh, as I think we're learning tonight, it's a much broader issue when it comes to technology. It's not just about uh, the images uh, that we're trying to protect our kids from. Uh, do you have a, a social media account? 23% of the students, um, certainly uh, uh, as kids get older, the numbers become higher, but 23%, it's not a huge number. Um, but when they were asked if they had social media, 23% said yes. When they were asked in the next question, um, what social media do you have? Uh, a large percentage of students that said they didn't have social media said they have WhatsApp and uh, Instagram. And so the concern there is, is that they're not aware that they have social media. And when you are not aware of the behaviors you're engaging in, social, again, this is not an indictment or negative. I think social media, if utilized correctly, can be huge, a huge opportunity. Um, but if you're not aware that you're engaged in social media, then the consequences of, of uh, social media become that much more likely. 29%, um, uh, sorry, 31% of uh, middle school students own cellular phones. 43% uh, of those students own smartphones. 29% uh, own portable devices, iPod Touch, iPad, Kindle, etc. 48% um, have misrepresented their age online. The question is, if Gmail thinks you should be 13 to have email if, if that's the age it should be. I don't know. Uh, we have to look at each community individually and we have to see where your class is. 
your child should never be the last kid in the class to have something. That's, that's not great socially, developmentally. They shouldn't be the first kid either. So we have to find a healthy medium, and I will tell you a secret. When your child, <coughs> when your child comes home and tells you everybody has it, <laughs> probably everybody doesn't have it. That's the secret. So if you walk away with one idea tonight, <laughs> the everybody has it speech, probably not. And here's where you have an opportunity to utilize social media in a good way. If you have a, a, a class WhatsApp group, hey, does everybody have this? And this way you can communicate. So there's great opportunities uh, within social media to um, engage in that sort of parenting. 11% of students reported having been the victim of mean or cruel behavior online. So that's consistent with the national average. Um, and this is interesting. So um, about 12% um, of the oldest uh, kids who took the survey in the eighth grade utilized public Wi-Fi. About 12%. Um, when we compare the numbers from the parents, no parents said their kids use public Wi-Fi. Not one. Um, so there is a little bit of a disconnect there that is really important. Um, I think a lot of times parents may not be aware that the devices that they have uh, given their kids or that their kids have access to, they may not be aware that that gives them access outside of that. And that's something that we can discuss in a, uh, in a more meaningful conversation. 55% um, of the kids uh, reported being disturbed by an image or video clip that they saw. 55%. This number in the 50% range uh, is across the board. I see this in the uh, Orthodox, Modern Orthodox, Conservative. It's around 50% of kids who report being disturbed by, by things that they've seen online. With that said, the sensitivity of kids in different communities are going to be different. What disturbs someone in one community uh, might be very different, might be innocuous uh, in another community. So let's keep that in mind. I've been saying the last couple months um, I've been disturbed by a lot of the images that I've seen. In my uh, shul wha uh, WhatsApp group, people are posting pictures of dead terrorists, um, videos that I actually find pretty disturbing. Um, and across our Facebook feeds, if we're sitting at the computer uh, and we're looking into our Facebook accounts or on our phone and our kids are over their shoulders, they are likely to see something that will disturb them. I know it certainly disturbs me, so I have to imagine that you know, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders are disturbed as well by some of the things that they see. Um, <clears throat> Ninety-one percent of YBH uh, students say that their parents are well informed about what they do online and on their cell phones. I think you should give yourselves a round of applause. Um, in the general population, <laughs> the parents say 91 percent. Here, the kids say 91 percent. So there is that uh, great, uh, your kids are not pretty much sneaking behind your back. And we, we didn't, as you know, we didn't call them on the phone while you were on the phone <laughs> to find out that information. Um, so they really... Um, are reporting that the relationship is there um, and they feel that you know what they're up to when it comes uh, to being online. We said in the general population, 85% of teens sleep with their cell phones within reach. 85? 70% um, of YBH students sleep with their cell phones within reach. So if your kids have cell phones, there's a 7 out of 10 chance that they're sleeping with it within reach. And we talked a little earlier about some of the impact uh, that that can have when it comes to their sleep cycles and, um, and how they uh, engage in school the next day. 59% of students report going to bed late as a result of their technology. So think about that, 59%, um, and that's uh, the sixth through eighth grade. Generally things, just to keep in mind, things sort of weight higher as you get older. Um, so it, uh, it will get higher in the uh, eighth grade than 59%, but they, this is a self-report. They're saying, I've gone to bed late as a result of my technology. 75% of cell phone owners, okay, so if the kid had a cell phone, 75% of those students reported going to bed late, and if they had a smartphone, 85%. So kids with smartphones, 85% of them report going to bed late. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. If we want our kids to get a good night's sleep, and we want them to be refreshed and ready to come to school the next day, we have to get the devices out of their room at night. 
All right, what can we do? <coughs> First thing is modeling responsible digital citizenship. It's hard to tell our kids to be responsible with their devices when we're driving down uh, the 95 and texting and uh, responding to emails. It's just it's hard to do that. We have to be consistent. And being consistent really includes modeling responsible digital behavior. If we're going to have a family dinner uh, during the week, and I know that doesn't happen often, but if we're going to have a family dinner during the week, we really need to put away our <coughs> devices. We need to say, this is a tech-free time for our family. We talk about going dark for dinner. I think it's amazing that we have Shabbos. I, I always say that um, our ever-advancing relationship with technology uh, just really um, underscores the superbness of the gift of Shabbos that much more. I think we experience Shabbos in a way uh, today that our great-grandparents did not experience because, like, almost every day was Shabbos. You know, what were they doing already? They were plowing? You know, come on. <laughs> so we really get to experience it in a, in a really meaningful way. So if we can duplicate that and replicate that during the week, um, that really uh, is helpful in establishing the expectation. Have set family hours where there's no digital engagement. Dinner hours, for example, the first half hour when a child comes home. Um, when the first half hour a child comes home is really critical. It's an opportunity before things, you know, I don't know if your kids come home sort of staggered. Mine do. One shows up at 4.15, one shows up at 5, one shows up at... So um, if there is a parent in the house at that time to greet them, that's really the opportunity to make meaningful connections with that kid. Um, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a quick exercise. Um, I usually do it a little. Yeah. Your child comes home from school, right? What is the uh, the first thing uh, you ask them? How was your day, right? What did you learn at school today? Oh man, this is a sophisticated crowd. <laughs> Most people say, "How was your day?" And when you tell your child, "How was your day?" I want you to say this all at once. Okay? I'm gonna do this. And you're going to say what they say. How was your day? Oh, wow. <laughs> Look at that again. How was your day? Right. So we get that one word answer. The really good parents in the room follow up um, with, uh, with a what did you do today? Okay. Let's try this again. What did you do today? <laughs> How was your day? What did you do today? Okay. So we all know this dialogue. <laughs> we all do it. We do it in, in, we do it in Farakaway, too. <coughs> so um, what's happening here is really we're engaging in a disingenuous dialogue with our kids. Because we know what we're going to ask them, and we know what they're going to say, and they know, and you know, we know they know, they know we know, and how's your day? Fine. OK, can I, can I have the iPad now, right? <laughs> That's the conversation. And so. I, I want you to try to trick your kids. You're going to throw them off. When they come home tomorrow after school, do something like, you know, tell me what you did today. And they'll be like, fine. <laughs> no, 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 tell me what you did today. Nothing. You know, tell me what you did today. What was the most interesting thing you did today? Who'd you sit with by lunch? Who'd you play with by recess? What's the most interesting thing your teacher said today? Tell me one thing you learned today. That's a novel concept. Tell me one thing, nothing, right? <laughs> so we want to engage in a more meaningful dialogue with our kids. So that first half hour with no electronics, um, you know, that's a, that's a great opportunity for that. If you do need to engage with uh, your electronics, be transparent about it. You know what? I just got an email from work I have to respond to. I'm going to respond to it, and then I'm all yours. Imagine how powerful that is. It's saying that I need to do this now, but I'm all yours, okay? We as parents have the biggest influence on what our kids think is appropriate and responsible when it comes to technology. And I'm not saying that. Your kids said that. When your kids were asked, 54% of them, that was the single greatest grouping. My parents are the biggest influence on what I think is appropriate and not appropriate when it comes to technology. So that responsibility is pretty great because they're growing up in this time and no one other than us really has that opportunity to make the impact and teach them what the expectations are. The correlations between the parent-influenced kids um, and the kids who say no one influenced me, there were a few of those. I'm not going to point out anyone here. I don't want to embarrass them. No, it's anonymous, so I'd have no idea. Um, parents, parents 
that uh, the kids who say that my parents have influenced me, they're the ones that also report that my parents have spoken with me about safe ways about engaging with technology. They're the ones who report that technology has, to a degree, improved the quality of homework and they spend more time connecting with family and friends. Okay? Positive, lots of positive correlations when it comes to the, the kids who say that their parents influence. The no one influences me, you know, tough guy, no one influences me. They tend to conceal their internet use. They have online friends they've never met. They tend not to complete homework. They tend to not eat or skip meals and they are more likely to receive images that their parents would disapprove of. So the relationship between being the parent, our kids want us to be the influences for them. 54% said so, that they are the influences. So the relationship is not just that, oh, my child can tell me that I'm the influence, I'm the positive influence. The correlations, the outcomes, the results are so much greater when kids report that. 56% report seeing an image or a video clip that disturbed them, but only 20, I don't think I said this. 56% report seeing an image or video clip that disturbed them, but only 20% of parents report the same thing. So more than half of your kids said they've seen something online that was emotionally disturbing to them. When parents were asked, only 20% reported that their kids had seen something that disturbed them. So what I'm seeing, and what I think this suggests, is that there's a disconnect. We need to engage with our kids more. They need to feel comfortable that when something comes across the computer screen, or their cell phone, or their device, they need to feel comfortable coming to you. And the only way to do that is to switch the dialogue from how was your day fine to tell me the most interesting thing you learned to say. Because if you get used to having that meaningful dialogue with your kids about the mundane and the daily routine, these conversations, the difficult conversations about technology and internet use and cyberbullying and substance abuse and all those difficult conversations become that much easier. But we really need to promote the relationship. We need to uh, get the communication going. Filters are critical. Um, students with filters on their devices are the least likely to plagiarize, conceal uh, their internet use, and lie about, about their ages. So filters are important. The worst thing is ambiguity, not knowing. Only 30% of students report that all their devices have uh, parental monitoring software filters. So only 30% of all the devices. So you may put it on your family computer, and you may put it on the iPad, but you forgot about the iPod Touch, or you forgot about the Kindle, or whatever. That consistency, the consistency in communication, and the consistency in action, um, is critical in having good outcomes as a result uh, of their technology. Limiting screen time is critical, and again, that goes back to the lack of ambiguity. If you say you can be on the computer now for a half hour, it's clear what the position is on screen time. So we have to set those limits, we have to set those times, and we have to stick to it. I know it's hard, I know it's hard, it's like a half hour, but if you give them another 10 minutes, you get another 10 minutes, <coughs> right? So um, it's hard, but that consistency is really critical. Digital engagement should be public. You know, uh, early in the internet safety age, we used to say that the family computer should be located in a central location. Um, now, every kid has devices, so um, <coughs> what we encourage is that if you are in my house, the rule is if you are on a device, the door to your room has to be open. And can they look at something they shouldn't look at? I mean, hopefully your filters are, are, are working, but the answer is that you're setting your position. <coughs> your position is being made clear. Um, and the expectations are clear. And that is more powerful than any filter, because kids can get around <coughs> filters, kids can go to public Wi-Fi, kids can go to the library, but if you've made your position clear, <coughs> then you're more likely to have better outcomes. Um, supervision of uh, all digital engagement, all devices should be charged in a central location, um, and you might want to do that for yourselves. And <coughs> going back to modeling good digital citizenship, uh, if we all say at 10 o'clock at night our devices go into this box uh, for charging, et cetera. I, I know uh, um, they were giving out, I think it was at a Project Inspire uh, program, something called the Shaw Box, where you can put your device in it and it actually has, you can plug things in, Shaw Box. Um, <coughs> improve dialogue with children. And really, if we had to um, identify the key issue with all of this, um, is the relationships. Uh, the relationships with our children are critical. Uh, because when you set a policy when it comes to technology or anything else, 
in isolation of a relationship, it just looks punitive. You say, okay, you can't have your device past 10 o'clock, you're just setting rules and policies. But it, within a relationship and understanding, you know, the response our, our kids give us, and I hear it all the time, the response is, what, you don't trust me? Anybody get that? Yeah, I got that, okay. What, you don't trust me? And the answer is, of course I trust you, but I love you, and I understand what the challenges of technology are. And because of that, I want to protect you, and I want to do my best to keep you safe. So it's not about trust. It's about, I always tell my kids the research suggests, but they don't seem to buy that. 75% <laughs> of students report being happy or very happy, which is really, you know, I think when we think, what do we want for our kids? We want our kids to be happy or very happy. I saw it in the lobby over here. Everybody seemed happy or very happy. Some of you didn't look so happy. <laughs> but most of you <laughs> looked happy or very happy. And really, this, this statistic is remarkable. 92% of your kids reported, they agreed or strongly agreed that they had good friends. And when we think about good friends, really that is, is so critical in their emotional development, their social development, and understanding where they're gonna be moving on in life. Thank you so much.